Good morning. Have a seat. Happy Father's Day. We are so incredibly thankful for all the good men in our life. There is something so incredibly special about a good man. And when he steps up and leads in the family, in the home, in the church, in the community, the world is a better place for it. And we are thankful for every one of the good men in our lives. Let me say a prayer for us. Dear Father, we love you. We trust you. We are so incredibly thankful for what an awesome God that you are. Thank you that you are a God worthy of all praise. I pray that you would be at work in our hearts today. I pray that you would incline us towards what is right and what is good, and you would strengthen and empower us to be the men and women you've created us to be. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Some years ago, I read a really cool book by a woman named Liz Bohannon called Beginner's Pluck. And in it, she shares a story about a woman named Sister Rosemary. Sister Rosemary was... Um, sent to northern Uganda to be the director of St. Monica's Tailoring Center back in 2002. And if you remember any of your history, 2002, Uganda was in the middle of a violent civil war. So she entered into a pretty dangerous area. And what was happening at the time is kids were being abducted from their homes and recruited into the army and other terrible, atrocious things. And so one of the things she started doing was just hiding kids. She saved hundreds of kids from being taken by just hiding them anywhere that they could, in cabinet, anywhere she could find a uh, crevice to just shove them in, she hid them. And when the war ended, what she realized was that these kids now needed more than just a place to hide. So she created a daycare for the younger kids and a literacy program for the girls where they were taught trades and vocations. What happened was a lot of the boys were able to return home, but because of the culture, the women, the girls, were left with no place to go. They'd been abandoned by the community and their families. So Sister Rosemary took them in, trained them up, and created this incredible program for them there at St. Monica's. So in the book, Liz uh, Bohannon talks about this time that she was in Uganda walking around with Sister Rosemary, and as they were walking around St. Monica, Sister Rosemary was saying just how frustrated she would get because garbage would always land on their property. And every day they'd go out, they'd clean up all the garbage, and more garbage would show up, and it was plastic bottles and bags and pop cans, and she's trying to create this healthy home and space for these kids to uh, grow up and find health and hope. And she said it just keeps getting more trash, and it was a constant frustration for her dealing with all of this garbage. But then one day, she came across this article about someone who had made an entire house out of plastic bottles. It caught her interest, so she started looking into it. You know, YouTube can pretty much teach you how to do anything. So she found these videos on YouTube and learned how you could turn plastic garbage bottles into homes. So it turns out that you basically pack these plastic bottles with mud, and when you layer them in and fill them in in the right way, they can be stronger than buildings made from brick, and they stand up better to earthquakes and bullets. It also keeps the um, housing cooler, the temperature cooler, which in Uganda is a blessing because it's hot in Uganda. So she needed more space to serve more kids. She didn't have the money to build more buildings, but she did have a lot of garbage. And so she learned in this process, all this trash she'd been picking up now seemed not a frustration to her, but a treasure. She said, every time I used to see another stupid bottle on my property, I got angry and asked why. Now I see those bottles and I say, thank you, Jesus, for more trash. Now I'm amazed by her heart and her creativity, right? Like to be able to work this around. But look, the problem she faced that was so frustrating became an incredible opportunity for good. And this imagery is so powerful for us because we face so many problems in life. But what if the problems we face become unique, incredible opportunities that God has actually gifted us to do good right now, right where we are? I love how um, the pastor Craig Rochelle frames this. He says, train your mind to remember problems are opportunities in disguise. See, we see problems, and we see problems, and they're trashy problems and garbage problems, and we don't like them, and we get frustrated. He says, you cannot control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. No one can stop you from reframing problems as potential opportunities. Listen, he says, every crisis creates unexpected problems. We've lived this, right? We've experienced this. But he says, every crisis also creates unprecedented opportunities. 
Most people just see the problems, but the best people, the best leaders, they address the problems and seize the opportunities. All right, I want you to hold on to this perspective in your mind because it's so powerful when we think this way. Everybody sees the problem, right? Everybody knows how to point out the problem and what's not working and what's going wrong in the world today, right? Everybody can see that. But it takes a unique perspective to say there is an opportunity here and we can do something about it. Friends, what if some of the problems that we're facing right now personally, in our homes, in the community, in our neighborhoods, in the world, in our country? What if some of these problems are places where God wants to use men and women just like us to find the opportunity to do something for good? What if the very people who are needed to solve the problem, to make the change, are people just like you and I? People who we have experience and we know how to do certain things and they might be exactly what's needed in this time to make a difference for good. See, I believe with all of my heart that the church is God's good idea. The church is an incredible gift to do good things in the world. And for the church to be healthy and thriving, it takes every single one of us being part saying yes to helping and serving and using our experience and our giftedness to make a difference for good right now where we are. Listen to how Paul frames this. He says this in Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 7. He says, But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Ephesians is this beautiful little letter tucked into the New Testament. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, General Electric Power Company, that's how we learned to memorize it 100 years ago, tucked right in there. And it's this letter that Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. And up until this point in the letter, he's been reminding us of these incredible truths about who God is. And then he starts making this transition. Okay, if this is who God is, this is how we follow him. So he's been reminding us about, you know, God chose us and he gave us this place to belong. And we've been saved by grace through faith. We've been saved by grace. It's nothing we did. It's what Christ did on our behalf. We don't do anything to earn what God has done for us. It's a gift we can only receive. Because of the mercy of God, his loving kindness, his goodness, his grace. Paul says, you are God's workmanship. And he actually means your masterpieces. You are God's masterpieces created in his image with intention and creativity and skill. Nobody is junk. Nobody is garbage. You aren't a mistake. You were crafted beautifully by a loving and wonderful God. And because you were made in the image of a loving and good God, you are capable of good right now. You're capable of grace because of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, if this is who God is, then how do we live? What do we do? And I love this, because he could have rolled out like the Ten Commandments and the do this and the don't do that. But here's what he says. He says, you work to grow in humility and gentleness. If you are following Christ, then you live with humility and gentleness and patience and you bear with one another in love. And he says, now look, because of the generosity of Jesus Christ, he shared gifts with us. And then he uses this quotation from a psalm that David wrote. I believe it's Psalm 68. And it's this imagery that David uses of God rescuing his people who were captive and setting them free. This was powerful language that the Israelite nation reminded themselves again of, this is who God is, and this is what he's done, and he set the captives free, and he gave them these incredible gifts. So then Paul uses that imagery to share Christ rescuing humanity from sin and death. Christ showing up and setting not just one nation of captives free, but all of humanity, all who would call on him, and then sharing these incredible gifts with us. Christ generously shares gifts 
with us so that the body is built up, the body of Christ. I'm going to use a couple analogies that Rick Warren gives us. They're really healthy in thinking about this. He says, when we say yes to following Jesus Christ, when we put our faith in him, God gives us four major gifts. The first one is the gift of forgiveness, right? We've been forgiven through what Christ did on our behalf. Not just for everything we've ever done, but for everything we ever would do, we've been forgiven. The second, we've been, we were given the gift of eternal life. We have these souls inside of us that were created for eternity. Even when our bodies wither away, because time is cruel in that way, even when these bodies go, our soul carries on with Christ. We're given the gift of his spirit, and it strengthens us and empowers us, and he encourages us. And then we're given the gift of special abilities. These special abilities, I, I, anytime I hear that, like everything in me is like superhero all the way. I wish that would be cool, but it's not what we need. I'll go to that church. <laughs> All right, what he's talking about is these are spiritual gifts. They're abilities that we need to get the jobs done that God has uniquely given us to do in the world. Spiritual gifts are given to us to put us in a position to be able to help and serve other people. Charles Swindoll explains them this way. He says they're a God-given ability or skill that enables a believer to perform a specific function in the body of Christ with effectiveness and ease. So here's what Paul's telling us. You are gifted. I think this is so huge and it's so easy for us to forget, right? God has already given us all the grace we need. All the grace we need has been generously given to us through God. God's given us gift to you, special talents, abilities, because he has a purpose for our life. He has work for us to do. And I think so easy it is to see the gifts in other people, what they're talented at, what they're good at, what they're able to do. And then we look at ourselves and we're like, I can't do that, right? And it, it, it makes us feel a little bit less than. Like, I don't have that talent, so I must not really be good at anything. But Paul just wants to wipe that right off the board. If that's how you think, stop it. God gifted you specifically. And we have different gifts. Some might have one set and you have a different but every one of us is gifted. And if gifted feels too strong of a word, then you have abilities. You have things that you know how to do. And what you know how to do can make a difference for good right now. What you know how to do, it matters and it's necessary for doing the good work that God calls us to do. No matter who you are, there's no qualifications. If you read the spiritual giftedness, when it goes through the Bible, there's something, we'll talk through some of them. There's like 20-some different gifts listed throughout the Bible. There's no qualifications. Like only guys have this set of gifts and girls have this set of gifts. Or only this age group gets this set and this age group gets this. There's no qualifications. To all of us have been given these gifts. No matter who we are, how old, how young, our background, our experience, God has gifted us. He's given us talents and abilities to do good in his church, and to help other people. Just think about how cool this is for a second. Because Paul's been building this idea through the whole, I wish we had time, we'd go through the whole book of uh, Ephesians together. God chooses us. We all know what it feels like to be not chosen, to be looked over, to be left out, to feel excluded, right? We've all had experiences in life where we know what it feels like to be on the outside looking in. God doesn't make us feel that way. God chooses us, and he brings us into this awesome relationship with him, and he gives us a home and a family and brothers and sisters that we are part of something awesome that he's doing in the world. And if it's not enough that he chooses us, he gifts us. He generously shares with us that we are empowered to use these good gifts right where we are to do good. So all of us are gifted in different ways and in different places. We all have gifts and abilities, things we know how to do that make a difference for good right now. But then how are we gifted? Look at what he says in verse 11. So Christ himself, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so the body of Christ may be built up. 
Okay, so he breaks down for us here five different spiritual gifts. He starts with the apostles. Literally, it means somebody who was sent. The apostles of Christ, what sets them apart is they were appointed and chosen by him, and they had seen the risen Christ. That's what made an apostle. They had been chosen and appointed by Christ, and they'd seen the real life living on earth risen Christ. But then he says there's a prophet. When we talk about prophets, we're not talking about predicting the, the future as in prophesying what's going to come. It literally means to speak before. What, it's somebody who God fills with the Spirit, and we have these weighted uh, words to plead the cause of God. And I can't remember where I found this. It urges the salvation of humanity, right? That's what a prophet does. They speak before God. They feel called by God to talk about who he is, that people might know him, and be saved. They feel the weight of God calling them to speak on his behalf. He says there are evangelists, people who just talk about Jesus. They love talking about Jesus and sharing the gospel and pointing people to Christ. Uh, the next one is pastor, or it might be shepherd in your translation, and it's literally somebody who oversees, somebody who cares for people. A shepherd takes care of their sheep, and the pastors, the shepherds, they care for people says there's a teacher, somebody who shares God's truth. It's interesting because in this context here, Paul gives us these leadership roles as gifts. And then he makes this incredible distinction. These roles exist. Why do they exist? To equip his people for works of service. Paul's telling us that God has gifted the church with leadership. There's a structure that leads the church. Men and women who say, yes, I'm in. You can count on me. Their job isn't just to get a bunch of things done on Sunday morning. There are lovely things happening. Their job is to lead people, to disciple people, to equip people, to mentor people for the gifts, the service, building up the church. What happens is the role was never meant to be one person leading, doing everything, all the ministry, right? That's never how it was supposed to be. The leader equips people around them to recognize their own giftedness, their own talentedness, their own abilities that help go into making the church a better place. And then the leaders disciple people to grow up in their faith and their giftedness and their talents. The leader mentors and teaches others to grow so that then they can lead and they can disciple others and the church multiplies and the church grows. That's a structure that is healthy for the church. It's healthy for the leaders, and it's healthy for the church. If there's only ever one leader doing everything, the ministry can't grow beyond what one person can do, right? Some of you are super talented, and you can do a lot, but all of us have a context for how much we can accomplish. And we want to build ministry that grows beyond just what one person can do. But it goes into the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And that happens when leaders step up to saying, yes, I'm in. I'm going to work with people. I'm going to teach. I'm going to disciple. I'm going to equip. So the church can do more. The ministry can do more. And as this discipling happens, the church grows and grows, which is how it's supposed to be. Paul loves a good analogy, and he loves comparing the church to the body. Because you need all the different parts of the body to work, right? If you've ever been down a part, you know it's a little rough going. I won't tell you about the time I was on crutches one time. I am a disaster, it turns out, on crutches. I fell all of the time. All right, you need the pieces. They work together, and the heart can't do all the work by itself, and the lungs can't do all the work by itself, and the right hand isn't more important than the left hand, right? Right? All of the pieces are necessary. And Paul says the same thing is true in the church. Your piece of the puzzle is necessary and it matters. Your giftedness matters. Your skills are important. They're not just important, friends. They're necessary. And if you've ever put a puzzle together, I'm OCD. And if I'm putting a puzzle together and there's pieces missing, it drives me nuts, right? Until I can find those pieces and get them back in. All right, your piece if it's not part of the puzzle, it's missing. And it's necessary for the church to be healthy and the body of Christ to grow. 
Look, there's all these different talents and gifts. There's spiritual giftedness that covers a whole wide variety. Maybe it's teaching, or maybe it's talking about Jesus. Maybe it's the ability to care for others, or encouraging people, or giving generously. Maybe it's leading or serving, or you have a head for details. I think people who can cover details are superheroes because I'm terrible at it, right? Maybe you aren't quite sure where you're gifted. I want to give you a little bit of a resource to help you because every person has gifts. Everybody has abilities that when we bring them together, it makes the church healthy and it helps the church grow. Rick Warren calls this, he says it's your shape, your five things that make you you. So S is your spiritual gifts. What are you gifted to do? Second is your heart. What do you love to do? What brings your heart alive and excites you? It says A is your natural abilities. We all have things we're better at doing than others. Have you ever done something you're not good at before? It's pretty obvious. There are things that I'm good at doing and things that I'm not. It says P is our personality, our own personalities that make us us. And he says, E is experience, what's unique to you. We have vocational experience, re relational experiences, spiritual experiences, and he even includes painful experiences. Listen to how powerful this is. Some of us have been through very painful moments in our life, and it might be exactly the thing that helps somebody else out right where they are right now. Some of our most painful life experiences might be the very place we're gifted to serve in a way that nobody else could because they could never empathize in the way we could because we've been there. We've walked that road and we know what it's like. It says when you think your way through these things, it helps you think about what makes me, me. And I love this idea so much about the church. The church isn't cramming yourself into a cup cookie cutter version and every Christian has to look this way and every Christian has to do this you get to be uniquely you what makes you you then God uses your unique experience to build up the body of Christ God uses your background and your heart and your talents and the things that are different uniquely about you to piece puzzle piece it all together to build up the church to be healthy if you've never done this before, it's um, a really cool test that you can take, an assessment. Um, you can Google it online. Just do shape assessment, shape test. It's by Rick Warren. Um, if you want a paper copy, if you've ever taken our Connect group before, gone through our Connect class, we actually do that together in there to help you start thinking about where you want to serve in ministry. We have a paper copy. It's, it's a little thick, <laughs> but if you want a paper copy, we can make one for you before you go. I encourage you, go try it. See what you find out about yourself that helps you think about who you are in the right way. But here's the second thing. Part of figuring out who we are and what our gifts and what our talents are and where we're gifted is just by getting involved. The best way to discover your giftedness is to try something, to volunteer, to sign up for something and see what happens when you get connected. I love so much, like, Try many things. Like, have you ever tried something that you're not good at before, right? Sometimes you learn what you like to do by learning what you don't like to do. Sometimes you know what you're good at by learning all the things you're not good at. It's probably not you. You're probably good at the very first thing that you try. I've learned the hard way through doing a lot of things that I'm not good at. But this matters because it's why we call it the joy of ministry. We're never going to say you have to do something because it needs being done, right? We want you to go into a spot that uniquely fits you so serving God feels like a joy. If you're in a spot that you don't fit, it makes you grouchy. It, it, it makes you frustrated. It makes you be like, oh, I don't want to go to church today. I have to do this thing, right? Nobody wants to do that. I love going to church on Sunday morning. I love hanging out and being here. But I've been doing stuff where I'm like, dear Jesus, <laughs> help me get through this hour. It is the longest. Okay. We don't want you to do that. So when you try things, try things. If it doesn't fit, try another thing. You're not stuck there for the rest of your life. You're trying to experience what it is that you're gifted at because when you do, you come alive. Your faith grows. Ministry is a joy. And guess what? It's a joy for the people who are around you. When we're grouchy, people know. We might be good at pretending, but we're not that good. People know, right? 
And we want ministry to be a joy for them as well. So we encourage people, keep trying. The best way to learn is to get started and do something, and you learn your way into your giftedness. A lot of times we feel kind of adrift because we feel like everybody else knows and I don't know. Do you ever feel that way before? Like everybody else has this like solid purpose. They have a plan. I remember being in school and people were like, I'm going to go to this college and I got this plan. I'm going to get this job. And I'm like, that sounds great. Three majors later, I have no idea what I'm going to do, right? All right, you don't just magically wake up one day and you're like, aha, I've got it figured out. Maybe you've had that moment. God bless you. 99.9% of us, we don't. But here's how we learn our purpose, by trying. You discover your purpose by doing things. The lack of doing, it's not just going to magically appear. You have to show up and try. The best way to learn where you're gifted, what your piece is, your purpose, what makes a difference, is by showing up and trying different things. And you discover your purpose along the way as you're out there trying. The church needs men and women who are willing to try. It's what makes us healthy. It's what makes us function and do the incredible things that we get to do. If you've not gotten connected to this part yet, there are little forms on all of the seats. Grab one, fill one out, and let's see a place that you might get to be connected. Our church is where we are right now because of men and women who stepped up and said yes. They moved from just showing up on a Sunday to consume something, right? To hear a good message, to being contributors. They don't just show up on Sunday. They actively participate on Sundays to be a part of the body to make it healthy. That's what got us where we are. But to grow our church into who we want to become, to do more ministry, to reach more people, to expand the reach of Christ here in Old Brooklyn, then it's a new group of people who need to step up and say yes to serving, to say yes for helping and doing our part, to say, I see a problem and I think I know how to fix it, or to say, I have this idea, could we try something? You know what we do? We build ministry around giftedness. And if you're gifted at something and we don't have a team that exists for it, you're excited about something, let's get some people together and start. Because the more excited we are, the more problems we know how to fix, the more opportunities we have for doing good right now. And friends, we are a church that wants to grow into the future. We have this beautiful place that we are right now, but we have seats and we want to fill them and we have this spot and we want to reach more and more of this community for good that people might see how awesome God is, how for us God is, that our generation might know God in a different way that makes all the difference in the world. We have incredible teams here in Old Brooklyn. I don't know if you've ever noticed before, but we have teams that show up and clean the church every week. They make it look good and smell good and it's clean and they just show up and clean the church so that we have an awesome experience on Sunday. We have teams of people who show up and make our outside, mow the lawn so the grass looks good. We have a cafe who makes coffee that's wonderful. You can know the difference because when I make it, it's not good. (laughs) But they make the coffee and they give us snacks and drinks and a fun place to be. We have teams that work to keep our church safe and our kids safe. We have this beautiful welcome team that makes sure there's somebody at the door to say hi to you, that everybody comes in, whether you've been coming for a while or you're brand new, you're connected and you're seen and you get to talk to somebody and you get to know what's going on. We have a tech team that knows how to push the right buttons at the right times and puts all the great images on the screen and puts it out on um, live stream for us and runs the sound and knows how, have you ever seen those like soundboards before? There's a lot of buttons, but if you like buttons, that is the right spot for you. We're working to build a team to help our Spanish translations right now because it turns out, you know, technology, it always takes a little bit more work than you think it's going to be. And we want to make sure that the right information is being processed. So we're building a team that helps us use the technology to reach a whole community for the goodness of Jesus Christ. All incredible areas to get connected. We have a food distribution team. They're better than the mail people. They show up no matter the weather. It's been rain, it's been snow, it's been sunshine, it's been sleet, it's been everything. But faithfully, every single month, year after year, we have people show up just to serve food in our community. Do you know the line gets longer and longer? Not shorter, because the need isn't going away. But we get to stand in a gap and say, 
God cares. We care. We're here to help. We have people who go out and do shopping for us and put together these pantry bags to go along with the fresh produce that we hand out. All of these are great places. But I want to highlight one of our ministries that's super important. I have a huge heart for our kids' ministry. I want every one of our kids who grow up in the church to know they matter, that we see them, that we value them, that they are valuable because they are made in the image of a wonderful and loving God. But for that to happen, we need men and women who will show up every week and spend some time with our kids, who will spend an hour hanging out with them and talking about Jesus and coloring pictures and playing games and asking how their week was at school. We need men and women who will just show up week after week and get involved in the lives of our kids. Our girls need uh, women in their life who tell them they're strong and courageous, that they have this beautiful identity in who Christ created them to be, and we see the best not just in who they are, but in who they're becoming. Our boys need men in their lives who will show up for them and walk through life day after day after day, that they have what it takes to be awesome for good right now, that who they are is made in the image of an incredibly awesome God. I want our kids to know the safest place they have to land when life gets hard is the church. Not when everything is perfect. Do you remember what it was like to be a teenager? Those were some messy years, right? We did not get everything right, but God willing, we had people who didn't abandon us through that phase of life. All right, I want our kids to know, even when they're not getting it right, this is still a safe place for them. I want our kids to know that God is for them, God loves them, and that we are here to remind them week after week after week God made them, and they have an incredible life and a purpose ahead of them. But for that to happen, we need people to show up week after week after week. I would love if just five people said yes to serving our kids, to boost our kids' ministry, that our kids might grow up knowing their love, their life is meaningful, and we value them, that we see them, and that we're here for them. I've told you this idea a bunch of times. It's one of my favorites. It's from Andy Stanley. The greatest contribution you make for the kingdom of God might not be something you do, but someone you raise. What if we were church, a church who raised up a generation of kids? Their life with God wasn't a gospel of sin management and what they got right and what they didn't, but their life with God was a relationship to Jesus Christ that was greater than anything what if that was the kind of church we are that raised up our kids to know that we are here for them, that God loves them and for them? Don't leave today without signing up for something. Fill out that volunteer interest form. You can hand it to the Connect team on your way out or drop it in our giving box on your way out. We are gifted to serve. We're gifted to make a difference right now for good where we are. Teddy Roosevelt gave a famous speech in 1910. This is what he said. That it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fair, fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat these words, every time I hear them, they just punch me in the gut. I love them so much. Look, it's easy to be on the outside looking in and be critical, right? There's a lot of critical people in the world, and they stand outside, and they say, this is right, and this is wrong, and this is good, and this is bad. It's so much different when you're standing in the arena. When you're in the arena, and you're sweaty, and you're dusty, and there's some blood involved, but you're in it, and you're not giving up. 
you know what it is to dare greatly. You get to see the awesome things that happen when you don't give up and you continue to go. Here's what I'm asking us today, friends. Every one of us, step into the arena. Put your foot inside the arena and dare greatly with us. The church is God's good idea. The church is going to grow again and again and again. And I want to be there when it does. I want you to be there too. I want us to be the church that God looks at and says, who can I bless today? And he sees us all waving our hand and saying, over here, God, we need your help. Show up. Bring some favor over this way, because if you don't, nothing good will happen. Please hear me. Your part matters. Your peace is important. God is calling you. Christ has gifted you. The Holy Spirit is empowering you to say yes to going all in to building up the church with him. We're going to get dusty. <laughs> We're going to get sweaty. Just because it's hard doesn't mean it's wrong. We're going to do hard things, but we are going to dare greatly, and we are going to experience the incredible joy of what it looks like to serve Jesus Christ in our generation with all that we have. The world will always be a better place when the church's focus is that. When we say yes and we go all in there, the world will always be better because of it. Dear Father, I pray that you would help us. I pray that you would strengthen us, empower us, encourage us. I pray that you would help us to say yes today to going all in for serving with you. I pray, Father, that you would give us the ability to try to step out one step in faith to say yes to going all in to this joy of ministry. I pray, Father, that you would help us be a church that is healthy and thriving because your spirit is active and moving among us. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.